Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and welcome to the DGAP's morning briefing on geopolitical, geopolitical challenges. I'm Henning Hoff, executive editor of International Politik Quarterly. Russia's war against Ukraine, we are writing day 421, has hit the headlines less frequently in recent days, but the visit of French President Emmanuel Macron to China the week before last certainly has. Macron traveled to China for a three-day state visit, a large business delegation of 50 CEOs in tow. He spent about six hours in talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping. For one day, he was joined by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who days earlier had sketched out an EU-China strategy under the headline of de-risking the relationship. On his way back, Macron gave an interview to Politico EU and French newspaper Les Echos. In this, he made some remarks which have proven quite controversial. Macron spoke of his pet project, Europe's strategic autonomy, and of his ambition of making the EU a third superpower next to the United States and China. He warned that Europe should not be a vessel to America and spoke of the great risk Europe faces to get caught in a crisis that is not Europe's. And this was widely understood as referring to, the, to a EU, US-China military confrontation over Taiwan. It also seems that Macron continues to have high hopes that China could play a constructive role in ending Russia's war against Ukraine. Like Macron's 2019 comment about NATO running the, the risk of becoming brain dead, the interview has caused a big discussion about the EU's relationship with China, which I'm happy to say International Politik Quarterly anticipated in its most recent spring issue, the China Challenge. To discuss all this, we have three excellent speakers with us this morning. In order of appearance, they are Dr. Alice Ekman, Senior Analyst at the European Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris. She will assess Macron's China visit and the questions it has thrown up from a European policy perspective. A very warm welcome, Alice. Next, we will be hearing from my DGAP colleague, Dr. Tim Wuhlich, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Geopolitics, Geoeconomics and Technology here at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Tim will touch on the subsequent visit by German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock to China and share his views on the German-China strategy, which 17 months into the Scholz government is still in the making, but expected soon. Good morning, Tim. And last but not least, we have with us Una Alexandra Berzina Serenkova, head of the Asia Research Program at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. She is fluent in both Mandarin and Russian. And in addition to commenting on the visits and what they mean for Europe's approach to China, she will also tell us what to expect from the Beijing Moscow relationship. A warm welcome, Una. Each speaker has about six to seven minutes for the introductory remarks. We will be opening up for your questions and comments after roughly 30 minutes. For the Q&A, please raise your hand, introduce yourself, and put your question to the panel. You're also welcome to submit questions and comments via the chat function. Please note that this event will be recorded and that we have to close on time at 9.30 a.m. And with a quick word of thanks to my colleague Milan Nitsch, the DJP Central and Eastern Europe expert, who has been instrumental in organizing these events uh, from the very start, and to Dr. Jan Stöckmann from the director's office, who is supporting this event going forward, and also to my colleagues at the events and communications departments. Let's turn to Alice. Thank you so much, Henning, for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here. I will be brief because uh, Macron's visit to China has been the most commented one. <laughs> Uh, over Twitter and beyond in, in recent weeks. Um, so I would like to bring in the European angle uh, to the analysis of the visit uh, because I found that it's quite interesting and telling uh, that Macron's attempt to Europeanize uh, the visit had uh, has clearly been a partial failure. The initial intention was good. Um, as you know, he invited uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the commission, uh, to go with him to China, uh, and uh, Macron has, has always been uh, a promoter of a more of a more coordinated and more European uh, voice uh, and position on China. You remember well uh, in 2019 uh, when uh, President Xi Jinping visited France 
he invited uh, Angela Merkel at the time and Jean Paul Juncker no? to to uh, yeah to to show a more uh, I would not say united front because that's not the right expression but but uh, a more coordinated and a more common uh, position to uh, you know reinforce leverage uh, in front of of Xi Jinping in a certain number of uh, of points to discuss. But the difference is that it is much easier to Europeanize uh, and to coordinate a European position at home than it is in China. <laughs> in China, there was uh, two different uh, program agenda for Macron and Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, part of the of the first day uh, was spent together. Uh, the last part, uh, Macron visited uh, Guangzhou. That was planned. Uh, nothing unexpected here. But I think the Chinese were also very clever and maybe subtle in playing the differences uh, between them, or at least in offering different uh, welcome treatment. Uh, China clearly unrolled the red carpet uh, to Macron, knowing that he's a promoter, I mean, a strong supporter, not the only one, but a strong supporter of uh, uh, the concept of autonomic strategy, strategic autonomy, sorry, sorry, my strategic autonomy, and also um, maybe understanding when preparing the visit and, and following Macron's previous declaration at home and abroad that there is a potential uh, to praise the so-called France uh, independent foreign policy. As you know, the Chinese side love, they love the concept of strategic autonomy and, and they love to, to refer to the goal and to France independent foreign policy. Of course, we should, I think, be careful in the, in the historical comparison between Macron and the goal. It's very different context. Uh, himself is not making direct comparison and an analyst, I think they should be limited to the comparison. But there were clearly difference of treatment. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen was clearly not uh, as well welcomed as Macron for one reason that you all know uh, is her speech, which was quite uh, long and detailed and quite strategic. I must say that was uh, pronounced before her visit. Um, and which was received in very severe terms, including by uh, the uh, China, Chinese ambassador to the EU or uh, uh, head of office, I would say, who, who, who in an interview given to Chinese TV, uh, CGTN said that it's uh, a speech that had no coherence, among other, uh, you know, uh, description uh, in tough words of uh, a speech. For various reasons, one was a clear line on Xinjiang and human rights violation. Another one uh, was uh, uh, reference to Taiwan and, uh, and um, importance to maintain peace and stability. Uh, another was uh, uh, reference to uh, uh, to the different uh, degree of openness of the market. I mean, there is many points in uh, in uh, Van der Leyen's speech that uh, unpleased uh, the Chinese. But that could, this speech, I found it quite strategic and uh, was a timely and clearly uh, between the speech and, and the visit of both to China, there was a lack, I think, of uh, coordination. Not that there was no coordination. As you know, Sela von der Leyen visited uh, Monday just before the visit, uh, visited Paris and exchanged with Emmanuel Macron specifically to coordinate the visit. So again, I, I don't want to. Uh, to simplify, you know, uh, Macron's visit saying it was completely uncoordinated, it's complete failure. Uh, the initial attempt was to coordinate and there was clearly a step of coordination, but the end result had held by difference of treatment by the Chinese, but also uh, fueled by also different position on, 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 on the content and on, on, on key position um, led, I think, to, to very messy image. Uh, <laughs> of uh, of uh, EU member state in, in EU's position and, and not just the trip itself, not just the interview given by Macron on the return flight, but also all the reactions that followed are very interesting uh, for us analysts, <laughs> but they show a very messy image of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Europe and EU unity to, I mean, the lack of EU unity to, to China open air. And I think this discussion would have better uh, stayed uh, closed door uh, internally to the EU, uh, if possible. So this this is important because uh, I know Joseph Borrell yesterday in speech um, 
even Parliament mentioned that uh, plurality is, is important, but uh, you know, uh, coordination is even more. And uh, I tend to agree with him because uh, from a Beijing perspective, um, I think maybe in France, but maybe also I remember state tend to overestimate uh, the world that, I mean, the way China is seeing us in the long term, in the short term, countries like France who are praising uh, whatever strategic autonomy or not whatever, who are praising strategic autonomy and independent foreign policies, they, they are perceived as very useful Western player in the short term. So it's useful in the short term, but we are not priority long-term partner. When you look at China's Global Security Initiative, for instance, clearly is a priority partner is uh, labeled or seen as a developing world. Uh, when concept that is mentioned used by China to, to say the global south, or whatever we call it, uh, China, well, China mentioned Africa 14 times in the concept paper of the GSI and uh, Europe uh, never. Uh, that's one example of one other that shows that China has a coalition building strategy that includes uh, reaching out to uh, what they see as non-Western part partner, uh, mainly from the developing world, in a long-term strategy that they aim to weaken what they see as a Western camp. I know it sounds simplistic, but there is really a strategic of coordination that is seen from a Chinese perspective as a long-term one and which put us, both the US and Europe, in the same bag. <laughs> So I believe not just intra-European uh, tension are uh, not in our interest, but strategic tension, uh, open-air one, uh, are seen as uh, positive from the Chinese side and are not in our strategic interest. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, everything should be aligned, and I assure we should fully uh, recognize that Macron did to place at a time of strong strategic tension. In France, for instance, there was a lot of discussion about the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, among uh, other the decision that has seen uh, and that has seen as uh, unfair or uncompetitive, or, I mean, uh, unfairly competitive from a European perspective. Um, but that uh, sort of tension that also added to previous tension related to AUKUS, uh, 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 all this this tension, uh, I think, should not uh, uh, lead us to think that we are in a frame of a strategic triangle. Uh, where you would have three pillars, uh, Europe, the US, and China. Now, when, when uh, Macron suggests a third way or positioning uh, Europe in between, well, we have to, to always double check the exact wording because there was a lot of debate about what he actually said. But he, he's been suggesting on various occasions, not just the, just the, the return of flight, that you know, Europe should, should be a third pillar or third way in between. My, my analytical position, and again, it's not a political judgment or anything, but it's that uh, it's misleading to, to see the world according to this strategic triangle, just because it underestimates the level of rapprochement between China and Russia. It underestimates Russia as a part of a pillar that China is building that is seen as anti-Western and uh, an alternative to uh, Western norm. And also it underestimate uh, China's strategy to reach out to the developing world. Uh, so um, the uh, type of relation that is developed to uh, so-called third countries is, is very important, far beyond this strategic triangle. So I will stop here, hoping that uh, set some, uh, you know, some key point that we may lead to a more precise discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, maybe one very quick, uh, quick couple of question uh, with, with, with a please, please answer very shortly. Um, how far away do you think is, is Europe, uh, or, or how big are the differences actually, um, how to approach China? Is, is it really, is, is Macron so far away from the rest? Actually, it's not so far away when you look at the, at, uh, at the facts. It's a discourse that uh, seems maybe in decalage uh, with uh, other positions and partly in decalage with uh, Van der speech, but in the Hague, in his speech, he, you know, he, he reminded France's position on Taiwan. He is about is for the risking, you know, concept that was also promoted in Van der Leyen's speech. He's fully aware of, uh, you know, the strategic challenge and systemic uh, rivalry that uh, China is uh, is posing. At least that's how already he was uh, analyzing, you know, Belt and Road Initiative uh, when he 
described it in a conference to ambassadors uh, in France uh, four years ago. So I think that it's really not, uh, I mean, France, French diplomacy, the president is not naive, to be honest. Uh, and this, this, this has been overstressed and maybe overblown in, in recent uh, days, but for logical reason, for understandable reason, because the communication, there was a big issue of communication and coordination. But in terms of position, when it comes to uh, access to the market, uh, to uh, de-risking when it's come to, it comes to uh, Taiwan, uh, when it comes to, uh, um, to Kai, I mean, most of the, of the topics that are on, on the EU agenda, I think that there is a strong convergence. And again, there is really strong willingness in Paris to keep Europeanizing, you know, China discussion and China position. So we should remember that under the French presidency, but also before, you know, there's a, you know, there's a promotion of, uh, of uh, a more coordinated strategy, or the promotion at the EU level of the adoption of uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, has been uh, very much supported by France among EU other EU member states. So, yeah, the, the, the gap between uh, communication and actual decision and, um, and 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 position is an issue here. Thank you very much. Um, Tip over to you. The many uh, in our audience, in our online audience, are German, so I'll try to be really concise. Uh, maybe picking up the ball that my uh, uh, great colleague Alice uh, has just left, uh, which is, um, uh, I mean, Baerbock's visit, uh, as uh, many of you will know, was thought to be the next European trip. She was, uh, so she intended to go with um, the High Representative uh, for Foreign Affairs, uh, Mr. Borrell, who actually caught uh, COVID. Um, question then, sort of, uh, what picture of unity uh, would have been possible to give um, after sort of the at least the the uh, image of disunity that had been uh, projected before, and also with Germany itself being quite disunited. As I'll just. Um, uh, outline in the next few minutes. Um, but maybe one comment from my side sort of uh, on Macron, because I think that uh, Elise has made uh, the point uh, very correctly and rightly reminded us that it was Emmanuel Macron who was the one who tried to Europeanize um, France's approach to China uh, before the pandemic. Uh, he was again the one picking it up. He was the one who had also uh, invited uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Uh, not not invited him, but he wanted to have a joint trip with Scholz uh, end of last year to China. Um, and Scholz, it was Scholz who refused it. Um, also, Macron is being someone who has always been quite forward leaning and quite progressive on China. Yes, uh, this may be more about the U.S. here uh, than maybe about his views on China. Nonetheless, and uh, he is said to have a very good relation with uh, Ursula von der Leyen. So I'd, I also would rule out sort of personal um, uh, reasons for sort of a lack of, of uh, coordination here. So so it's I think it's quite remarkable that we're now talking about Emmanuel Macron uh, in this context as so, some sort of being the spoiler of a European position. Um, I, I do take issue with uh, quite a number of things that he has said in substance. It's just, I think, remarkable. Now, sort of maybe three quick points. First, the German reaction to it. I think it was as divided as the coalition government is on the issue itself. You found uh, someone like the social democratic uh, uh, leader of the uh, in the parliament, Olf Mützenich, uh, with explicit support uh, for for what Macron has been saying, essentially arguing, well, we can get into the middle of a, a great power conflict between the United States and China. We should really stay out. Um, Taiwan is not as much of an issue for us. Uh, so an explicit uh, expression of support. You had an implicit or explicit disagreement uh, from Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, who I think never sort of really mentioned Macron here, but the uh, who tried to position herself explicitly sort of uh, addressing some of the controversial issues and positioning herself at quite opposite. Um, also a very uh, vocal voice uh, from the opposition, um, uh, Christian Democratic Party, Mr. Röttgen, uh, being explicitly uh, uh, addressing Macron and distancing himself from it. 
And then there was Social Democratic Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who essentially stayed silent, as he does on many occasions. So the reaction was really divided. You can't say Germany supported or or uh, pushed back. Uh, it really depends on whom you're talking about. Uh, second point I want to make: uh, it was it's um, not only uh, the division uh, in Germany; um, it is also uh, really here a question, sort of what is being in the focus. Um, on many of the substance, I think there is quite uh, agreement also across the government. So I've now just sort of uh, put out uh, the the general narrative that is that Germany is divided, isn't speaking with one voice. But you could also say, well, there is some uh, common ground, actually common ground within Germany, common ground, I also think, with Macron, with with EU Commission President von der Leyen, with so many in Europe, and that is that de-risking diversification should be at the center uh, of uh, Europe's China strategy, including Germany's, at reducing strategic dependencies. I think we can debate whether the reduction of dependencies is enough or whether we also need to have something sort of more proactive, which I think is, is the case. Also, this focus on economic security is something that also resonates with Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, a lot. I think the divisive issues are uh, three questions here, both for uh, for uh, Germany, but also uh, probably for uh, wider Europe. Uh, this is whether we are talking here about a world that is essentially uh, organized in two blocks or whether we look for uh, in, into a future of multipolarity and that also relates into questions how uh, deep our um, cooperation with the United States should be. The second question I think that is somewhat divisive here is whether we can have a simultaneous um, economic disentanglement from Russia and China at the same time or whether we need a sequence, whether we can actually as Germany afford uh, um, distancing ourselves, disentangling ourselves from Russian fossil fuels, and at the same time do the same with China. Uh, and I think the third uh, issue that people in Germany and also across Europe uh, answer quite differently is how acute the Taiwan crisis, uh, a, a Taiwan uh, crisis scenario is, uh, because that uh, then raises the question how much time we have. I think I'm somewhat running out of time, so I'll make uh, a very quick third point. German-China strategy, because Henning uh, hinted that I would say something about it. Frankly, I think uh, it's mm, we have come as German as German government. I think it has come quite some far with preparing it. Uh, it's a bit a court in domestic politics. I think it does reflect some of the commonalities I just pointed out and divergences within the government. But the most important hindrance at this point is really not the China strategy itself, but the, the national security strategy is supposed to come in first. And I don't have the time now to reflect sort of on the details of the NSS. Happy to do that if there's any questions. But I think there's political divisions on the national security strategy. And before those are resolved, we won't see the China strategy, which is why it is so difficult for a China watcher to estimate when the, the China strategy is going to be published, because after all, it mostly depends on the national security strategy. So I leave it here by saying six weeks after the national security strategy, we'll have the China strategy whenever this is. Thank you very much, Tim. And if, if you want to, to read more about Tim's view on, on the, the emerging China strategy uh, uh, Germany will publish, um, uh, check out the uh, the spring issue of IPQ. I'll post the link in a moment. Um, uh, with, a, with, a, with an eye on the clock, let's move on to Una, please. Hello, thank you. Yes, uh, so I've been tasked with um, tying together two distinct topics, but at the end of the day, they actually come together quite nicely. So first of all, the Baltic approach to, to the topic my colleagues just uh, gave an overview of, and secondly, how does that relate to the Russia-China relationship? So. Let me just state that the Baltics are not against strategic autonomy as a concept fully, but there are three points, three nuances to be kept in mind. So first of all, the Baltics believe it's a long-term goal. So this is not something that we should be jumping into today because it's not achievable. Second of all, the emphasis should be on dependence reduction. Of course, European capability, capacity building, um, uh, indigenous competitiveness development, not turning the 
not turning EU into kind of a defense alliance to compete with NATO or to double NATO, you know, kind of a uh, um, something that could be used uh, for synergizing with NATO, rather. And third of all, that the U.S. is a key partner uh, for our region. And basically, the Baltics don't have uh, any other alternative in terms of security uh, currently, and also for Ukraine. So a key partner for Ukraine. Now, let me uh, unroll these points a little bit. So when we say that the Baltics are not believers in strategic autonomy, we should definitely add the word immediate believers and immediate strategic autonomy. Uh, the Latvian official position actually um, um, has been consistent even before Russia's full-scale invasion. So in 2020 and 2021, we see, for example, the Ministry of, which is a weird case when the ministries actually agree, because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Economy tend to disagree on China policy, on uh, on a lot of things. But here, actually, both have come up with documents saying that, you know, um, Europe should build up resiliency, lessen critical dependencies. But the efforts for strategic autonomy should not create an impression that the EU's goal is to become, you know, military autonomous uh, or to duplicate the functions of NATO, because that would affect transatlantic unity. And transatlantic unity is a, a cornerstone of our security, as I said. So against this uh, background, we can see that when there are some statements that I think Alisa brilliantly impacted and Tim also uh, looked into, um, the, especially, of course, of President Emmanuel Macron, um, we see that, of course, these statements, especially the, the more louder ones, the, the ones for Les Echo and uh, Politico, um, have not found support um, uh, among the Baltic strategic communities. And it's not just the statements, it's also the overall, overall business orientation of the visit, I should say. So, and two reasons why, why they have not found support. Well, first of all, um, there's a war right here and um, now it kind of feels like now is not the time to deepen the rift in the transatlantic relationship. So it's bad timing in a way. Um, second of all, and this is how I tie this masterfully, I must say, and, uh, <laughs> uh, into the second point, um, to China's sympathetic portrayal of Russia as a future element of China-led security outlook is, is an issue. And that's something that Alice uh, spoke up, right? So when you have European voices calling for China's constructive role in ending the war, it sounds naive uh, because this region is very well versed in Russian expansionist thinking and kind of has has been down this road before. And I think that is 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 quite indicative because we, 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 the 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 indication of this is has come out of all the Baltic states in Poland, for example. Let's start with Poland. We have Morawiecki uh, accusing um, Europeans of of making a historic mistake, potentially historic mistake, by by expanding ties with China. Then, of course, we have the Lithuanian uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, someone who we know very well because of Lithuanian Taiwan policies, Gabrielis Landsbergis who has tweeted uh, that right after Macron's visit that, you know, for years the West said economic cooperation would persuade dictators to support rules-based international order. Our strategy clearly failed with Putin. Now, instead of increasing defense spending and manufacturing output of strengthening our transatlantic connection, we are asking another totalitarian to help us, quote-unquote, secure peace in Europe. This would be a mistake bigger than Nord Stream. So he uh, kicked kind of two big European countries in one sentence in a way. And then, of course, we have um, the Estonian PM, uh, Kaja Kalas, who has just been real, whose party was just reelected. So that shows support to her. And she uh, just was approved on her third cabinet. Right. So the, the parliament approved her third cabinet. So that, you know, shows that she's a very stable uh, politician. So in a way, representing a huge part of Estonian society, Estonian political thinking. And we've heard her criticizing Macron's phone calls to Putin already for months, right? So this is not something new or unexpected. This is, she's been saying, stop calling Moscow, basically. So that 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 covers, I think, the Baltic positions and, and the Baltic thinking here. Uh, and now to the second bit, what, what can we expect from this Beijing-Moscow relationship? Because that, of course, is the big uh, factor in how we approach as Europeans and how we approach Beijing. Um, and I want to, rather than, you know, giving a bird's eye view, I want to zoom in into a, a, a particular case, something that's 
the most uh, scandalous and debated, the military cooperation, right? So um, we've all seen the article by Alex Gabuyev in, in Foreign Affairs, where he's actually doing an interesting thing. He's uh, looking at the, the the people who represented the Russian delegation during the C. Putin meeting just now in Moscow, and he makes the conclusion that most of these folks were military industry folks on the Russian side, even though the 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 name list of the delegations were not publicized. So those are weapons folks. Those are um, space folks, right? So he makes, a, I think, a founded conclusion that there's something going on in that field. Uh, and of course, now we have the visit, visit of Li Shanfu and him meeting Putin, right? The, the Chinese uh, minister for defense, which is quite unprecedented. Um, and I think these meet, but what can we say? Do we can can we kind of conclude that China is going to support lethal force um, weapons to uh, to Russia? I wouldn't go that far immediately. I would say that, first of all, we see that there is a bargaining taking place, heavy bargaining between Russia and China. Power of Siberia 2 story and not having it signed immediately uh, also speaks to that to that uh, hypothesis that there is a um, a bargaining um, taking place. Um, so I think that for China to um, jump to lethal force into um, uh, exports for Russia and to subject itself to a very heavy response from the West, um, it has to be a very, very enticing offer, an offer that they can't infuse and refuse because the risks are major for China, obviously. And so what are the colleagues writing about? What could be these um, these lures and these things that could make up for, for, for a bit of bad weather or a lot of bad weather for China on the European side? Well, first of all, uh, those could be Russian technologies or uh, some of the uh, uh, missiles, so anti uh, air, so air defense. Um, uh, some of the technology for um, submarines and sub subwater drones, and maybe there's something going on in terms of more access to the Arctic, space tech. Uh, again, we hear Belt and Road is being spoken about during these meetings. Uh, maybe, uh, and Russians again are being reluctant to s endorse Belt and Road, but are speaking about their own pathways. But maybe that's something China's been pushing for, so it's economical. Uh, right now, China, of course, is saying we have Chinese uh, PM Qinggong saying, no, we will not be um, supplying that sort of weapons. But of course, uh, rhetoric is one thing. And But I would say that we should concentrate on the fact that there are also other ways of support. Um, you can provide, for example, as some of the colleagues uh, in the room have rightly noted, uh, SATNAV support. You can provide components, keep providing components, or rather have plausible deniability, say that those are companies, uh, private private companies, or this has been done before the war, for example. Um, it will sort of just help with, with, with sanctions. Um, I think that lethal force is a psychological and... Uh, 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 a judicial um, kind of watershed uh, for for China. So uh, uh, the question is how much Kremlin is willing to give up to attain that. So uh, again, I would not be giving all, I would not be putting all my chips on lethal support from China to Russia, but I want to go back to Alice's point. In China's eyes, global security initiative, uh, you know, shared norms, shared narratives promotion, Russia is the solution not the problem, not just for the war in Ukraine or Russia's war in Ukraine, right? But for the global security architecture's future as such. And we should be very aware of that when we as Europeans craft our China policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Una. Um, we surpassed the 30 minutes mark, so so uh, please um, uh, have your questions ready for the panel. Um, I prefer uh, you to, uh, to raise your hand and, and put your question uh, in person. And while we wait for that, maybe maybe go to Elise. Um, uh, sort of, what do you expect are the next steps for sort of really forming a, a European sort of a united uh, European approach to China, or is this something which is over ambitious anyway? And, and probably we will always have the sort of the bigger countries are sort of playing their own games on the side. We had one suggestion here at the chat that that uh, uh, we should also look at at the sort of Chinese economic interests in China and that they they were sort of uh, sort of by by the the the, uh, the number of contracts which have been signed sort of uh, sent the exact opposite um, uh, message uh, than de-risking. 
don't know whether that's true or not, uh, but um, um, I would be interested in, in to, to, to get your sense of sort of well, what are the next steps? Will we have a big discussion in Brussels? Um, sort of, will we have a policy document? So. Well, we need to learn the lesson from what has been going on in the, in recent days. Uh, this is serious. I believe um, it's timely to adjust the China strategy of 2019. To what extent should it will be should it be formalized? But the adjustments be um, well sought and you know discussed and and coordinated, and, and then it should be you know the guiding frame. For member state, I think uh, when they, you know, when, when they engage and 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 uh, and, uh, and shape their relationship, uh, recent development, uh, upcoming development with China. So no, I, I think it's it's uh, we are really at 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 a turning point here, and I want to refer also to Una's point. I mean, Una, you were great. <laughs> All you said there is is uh, especially the conclusion about China Russia. I mean, uh, unity of Europe, if it may exist at some point, regarding China should take into account uh, the actual nature of the China-Russia relationship, the norm normative dimension of the rapprochement, including the security norm uh, dimension. So the problem now, I believe, is that uh, several member states have different analysis of the, China the nature of the China-Russia relationship at this point in time. It's been a problem for a long time before. I mean, the, uh, the the threat assessment has been diverging among member states for geographical reason and historical reason, as Una, uh, you know, uh, rightly summarized as a view of uh, Baltic states. Also, you know, Russia is seen as a as, as a primary threat for a long time, you know, uh, because they have you know immediate exposure to the threat and also because they. They are familiar also with the political system often more than we are, etc. And a few years ago, we were seeing a divergence of threat assessment. Some member states were seeing Russia as a top threat, others were seeing China to some extent, and, and, and France was tending to see China as a, as a, as a top threat in comparison with Russia. And then there was this uh, hypothesis about uh, maintaining dialogue with Russia to create a wedge or the distanciation between China and Russia, which I found quite naive, uh, or at least not in line with the assessment we, are, we were already doing at the time of the rapprochement between China and Russia, which in my mind is much more than a marriage of convenience. Already since 2015, 2016, we were seeing signs that it's much more than this, and due to the normative conversion that uh, that uh, Una refers to. Now, um, even if it was not explicitly said as uh, such, I believe that there was this general hope that by maintaining a form of, you know, by uh, by by fueling a rapprochement or that, that uh, talking about renewing bilateral relations with, with China, a form of discussion, you could, uh, well, Macron said, uh, it's hard to translate because I have the French uh, sentence in mind, but he said he believes he would, he's confident that China would bring uh, uh, Russia back to its reason. I don't know how to translate to its sense, basically. To which, sense. Also, which I found quite naive <laughs> personally, uh, because it's not the same thing again as the, the, the concrete uh, rapprochement between China and Russia. So I believe a more unified EU approach toward China is should be based on a more unified analysis of the China-Russia relationship at a time of war uh, in Ukraine. This is this is really uh, essential. We cannot and 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 based on this analysis. Uh, how to prioritize and condition uh, China's, I mean, the Ukraine, no, no, Ukraine file on the agenda of uh, EU-China relations. Should we condition it? No, the, the way, for example, Borrell framed it in his speech that was released on his blog, and the one that he would have pronounced if he was able, uh, as planned, to travel to, to China was to, I, I, I quote in substance, but he said basically that uh, the way China interact with Russia will condition also we we have consequences for China the future of China EU relation. Sorry, I quote by memory, yeah, so it's not so precise. But I mean, again, if you go with China and sending this message, you know, uh, let's uh, reinforce uh, you know trade ties and business cooperation, and uh, by the way, <laughs> um, let's do something, uh, you know, in Ukraine, or let's uh, you know that 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 doesn't work. Uh, 
clearly, uh, if you look back at the EU-China summit of um, 1st April 2022, quite some time ago already, video conference summit, um, there was an issue of priority because for the EU, of course, the war in Ukraine is a, is a priority to, to address and it's an urgent issue. And for China, clearly, it was not. And it did not adjust its position towards Russia or clarify its position, which I believe myself was not so ambiguous, but it did not adjust its position. And and today, I think uh, for future EU, sorry, I'm mean, almost done, but for future EU-China summit, clearly the agenda should be... Uh, coordinated in advance to make sure that uh, the war in Ukraine is a top priority of any discussion with China uh, before moving on to potentially other topic and maybe not moving on to other issue if the first one is not addressed uh, in depth. Thank you very much, Alice. We have one uh, question up by Philip Hilsman, but before we come to you, uh, Philip, maybe um, one quick question to Tim. Um, do you see a, a German leadership role here and sort of bringing bringing Europe together behind one China approach? No, um, as long as Germany at least appears to be divided in itself, I, I don't think that um, Germany can play a, a lead role. It would have the potential, I think, particularly um, if doing so in concert with uh, France. Um, but Scholz and Macron seem to be not on the same page when it comes to China, not least because Scholz uh, has refused the invitation by Macron earlier, I think. Um, well, I leave it here. Uh, I think there, there have also been plenty of fascinating questions in the chat that I'd like to touch upon. Leave that to you, Henning. But I, I, no, I don't I don't see Germany ready at this point to take. I mean, potentially, of course, it could. But I, I don't see it. Uh, maybe, maybe if you allow one, one question, because that was in the chat, qualified majority voting. I think it would be decisive to have that uh, on European level. It would be great. Scholz, uh, that, that's why I'm binding it together. Scholz is, is saying that he's supportive. Uh, all major German uh, political forces are in favor, but I, I believe it's quite unrealistic. But I think that does lead us in the end to the question, will we have sort of an EU of two speeds? Will there be sort of a, a fractional integration or not? Will some uh, 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 member states form a group that's coordinating foreign and security policy more closely than others or not? There's pros and cons. Um, would love to discuss it with Una and, and Alice as well, uh, how, how you see that. But uh, I think the question is somewhat on the table at some point if we stay so disunited um, uh, on on uh, China and other issues. Um, to me, per se, uh, it's not ideal, um, but I kind of run out of uh, alternative models to sort of for, uh, form a not then not sort of completely united uh, uh, European position, but sort of more of a united front to pick up at least uh, uh, reference to the Chinese term. Well, I think we, we are out of time, but it would be sort of uh, <laughs> a shame to, to let you go without what, hearing from you very, 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 very short sort of final sentence. Um, so I think my, my, my most pressing pressing question is, is really sort of where are we heading and, and sort of will we continue to see this kind of divergence and, and sort of disunity um, or, 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 or are you optimistic in the EU sort of finding, sort of coming around a, a bigger strategy, maybe about or quite, quite likely about de-risking um, um, to approach China? Um, and maybe we sort of start again with Yuna, then Tim and Ali says an last word. Against my better judgment, I want to be optimistic because I think that Ursula von der Leyen's speech in Merricks was something that most, if not all, European countries can sign under. And I think the way these things were worded um, actually do, but I'm talking, of course, about Duriskin and about the, the balance between values and cooperation. So I think there is a way. The question is, how much will is there? Thank you. Tim. Uh, yeah, I agree with what Una says. Maybe also all the mess that has been created by differences in, in, in messages at this point which I think everyone acknowledges as well, regardless of where you precisely stand, whether you side with one or the other interpretation, maybe that is also somewhat a wake-up call, maybe not for all of Europe, but for uh, large parts of Europe, 
I'd also say uh, the disunity is not so much at EU level. I think uh, if we look at what decisions are being taken in Brussels, it's normally not so controversial in Brussels. The question is more sort of when member states come in, uh, do we ultimately abstain from uh, also pursuing and, and pushing forward sort of uh, national self-interest, mostly economic self-interest? And I think here it, we, can, we Germans can't just blame it all on on, on France. The same goes for Germany. Uh, and finally, I think Una is right. I think there are also com quite quite some commonalities in perspective here de-risking may indeed be sort of a a, a a lens to which many not all i think but many can can look so slightly optimistic thank you and at least do you share this optimism yeah we can only be optimistic can you only get better after such a mess um also to link it to the question on taiwan the, the issue okay there was a question of also framing and eh? because macron's point was uh um, China's, uh, no, it was, um, basically he talked about China's overreaction as it was, uh, US rhythm and China's overreaction. So it's also about, uh, as if, you know, China was just reacting and had no um, plan or ambition, but I understand your point. And I think it will also lead to, it is also already leading. I mean, this, uh, all this discussion following Macron's, uh, connection, it is leading to, um, uh, a stronger consideration of the Taiwan issue. And uh, uh, also, uh, I would say clearer uh, EU's position on the topic. Uh, I mean, we have never seen so many <laughs> uh, leaders, including EU leaders, to to directly refer to Taiwan and so explicitly. Uh, so uh, on Taiwan, on the risking, on other issues, uh, I'm rather optimistic. We will see uh, clarification of the EU general frame framing of position and. I'm also optimistic that we will see a, a clarified adjustment of the China strategy that has been released in 2019 because it's needed uh, just to, to reflect the changes uh, in the region and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, everyone. Uh, please join me in thanking our excellent panel this morning. Um, uh, um, and um, uh, next week, um, we haven't since decided the topic yet, but, but please join us again um, when we are, we are having the next morning briefing. And until then, I wish you all a very good morning. Thank you for listening.